Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Anupama Chaudhary Devgan, your physiology faculty. This is the daily quiz series in the run-up to NEET PG 2025. I am in week three of these series and today I will be covering general physiology and muscle physiology. Tomorrow I start with renal and GI tract. So let's have a look at the first question. Now this says, in which phase of the ventricular muscle action potential is the sodium permeability the highest? So if you look at the ventricular muscle action potential, this is known as the pacemaker potential. The pacemaker potential has got five phases, phase 0, phase 1, phase 2, phase 3 and phase 4. Now, phase zero is the depolarization phase, and this is the phase which is due to opening of voltage-gated sodium channels, and this is due to a sodium influx. And this is the phase where the sodium influx will be the highest. So, phase zero is the phase in which the sodium permeability is maximum. Now, let's have a look at the other phases as well. Phase one is the early repolarization phase. In the early repolarization phase, there is a closure of the sodium channels, which decreases the sodium influx plus an increase in the potassium efflux. In phase two, along with the potassium efflux, there is a calcium influx through what are known as the slow calcium channels. At the point of this black arrow, the calcium channels will close and in phase 3, you have uh, only a potassium efflux, which is known as the late depolarization phase. Phase 2 is known as the plateau phase. Phase 0, depolarization. Phase 1, early repolarization. Phase 2, plateau phase. Phase 3, late repolarization. And phase 4, there is a closure of the potassium channels. So answer to this question becomes A. Let's look at the next one. It says given below is the length tension relationship. Now what is the length tension relationship? This is also known as the Frank Starling's law. This is applicable to skeletal as well as to cardiac muscles. It is not applicable to smooth muscles. Now, in the length tension relationship, we take the initial length of the muscle or the sarcomere on the x-axis and we take the tension generated on the y-axis. The length tension relationship is applicable to isometric contractions. Now, as you can see in this graph, more the initial length, more is the tension generated. But up to a physiological limit beyond which Further increase in initial length decreases the tension generated. Now, the question says, which of the which point on the graph corresponds to the resting length, which is also known as the optimum length? Now, what is optimum length? Optimum length is that initial length at which if a muscle contracts isometrically, the tension generated is maximum. As you can see over here, this will be C. Right? This is maximum tension generated. This optimum length or the resting length corresponds to a sarcomere length of 2 to 2.2 microns. When the sarcomere length is 2 to 2.2 microns and it contracts isometrically, the tension generated is maximum. At optimum length, there is a maximum overlap of actin and myosin. There are maximum number of actin and myosin cross bridges. Maximum tension generated, maximum overlap, maximum number of actin and myosin cross bridges. At length, which is more than optimum length or less than optimum length, the number of actin myosin cross bridges will reduce. Now, why is it known as a resting length? It's got a very interesting explanation. Now, all our muscles at rest in our bodies, for example, when I have extended the elbow, my biceps is at rest, triceps is contracting. So, the length of the biceps muscle at rest 
length of the muscle at rest is at or close to the optimum length. That is why optimum length is known as the resting length. That means if I make a muscle at rest contract isometrically, the tension generated will be maximum. Hence, it is known as the resting length. Dihydropyridine receptors and ryanodine receptors in skeletal muscles are coupled by which of the following? Now, we know that the sarcolemma dips into the muscle fiber to form the tetibule. It invaginates. And in the skeletal muscle, this tetibule is at a I junction. What is AI junction? This is junction of A band and I band. On either side of the T tubule, you have the L tubule, which is nothing but the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And sarcoplasmic reticulum, the ends are dilated to form cistern. And these cisterns are storehouse of calcium. So the cistern, T-tibule cistern, forms a triad. See, advantage of the T-tibule is that the action potential now reaches right into the interior of the muscle fiber. And so it gives us a very well-coordinated contraction. So let us try and see what happens. Now, as the action potential after crossing the neuromuscular junction, as it spreads over the sarcolemma, it now will also move into the T-tibule. And present on the T-tibule membrane is the dihydropyridine receptor. What is this dihydropyridine receptor? This is a voltage sensor in the skeletal muscle, but it is in the cardiac muscle. It is a voltage-gated calcium channel. Please remember, this is an L type of channel has been asked as a neat PG question earlier. What type of a channel is this? This is an L type of channel. But in the skeletal muscle, it is a voltage sensor. Now, present on the L tubule is the ryanodine receptor. And what is a ryanodine receptor? It is a ligand gated calcium channel. What is the natural ligand for ryanodine receptor? Calcium. Now, as soon as the action potential reaches the dihydropyridine receptor, which is a voltage sensor, it detects this change in voltage and it undergoes a conformational change. Now, it is connected to the ryanodine receptor by a, uh, there is a molecular connection, a physical interaction, a mechanical coupling between the dihydropyridine receptor and the rhinodine receptor, which causes the rhinodine receptor to open and calcium is going to come out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the sarcoplasm. And this calcium will go and bind with troponin C. Then that undergoes a conformational change. Tropomyosin slides. Active sites on actin are exposed and the muscle begins to contract. Actin-myosin interaction starts and muscle begins to contract. So this is also something known as excitation contraction coupling. The electrical activity, that is excitation, is converted into a contractile activity by the release of calcium. So which is the excitation contraction coupling agent? Calcium. So two, three important points. Dihydropyridine receptor in skeletal muscle is a voltage sensor. In cardiac muscle, it is a voltage-gated calcium channel. What type of a channel? L type of channel. Between the dihydropyridine receptor and ryanodine receptor, there is a physical interaction. There is a mechanical coupling. The ryanodine receptor is a ligand-gated calcium channel and the natural ligand is calcium. Mutation of the rhinodine receptor gives rise to which condition? Malignant hyperthermia. Now, what is this kind of coupling? Is it electrical? Is it mechanical? Is it chemical? Is it electrical followed by mechanical? Now, the obvious answer here seems to be mechanical coupling because I've been using that so often in my explanation. But a slightly better answer is going to be electrical followed by mechanical. There is first 
a conformational change of the voltage sensor, then there is a mechanical coupling. So slightly better answer than simply mechanical is electrical followed by mechanical. A 35-year-old woman is in labor. As uterine contractions intensify, the release of oxytocin from the posterior pituitary increases, which in turn causes stronger uterine contractions. So release of oxytocin, stronger uterine contractions, and there is more release of oxytocin. This is known as a positive feedback mechanism. In negative feedback, please remember, the initiating stimulus is reversed. What is the initiating stimulus here? Uterine contractions. Right Here what is happening is uterine contractions cause release of more oxytocin which causes stronger uterine contractions which causes more release of oxytocin. So this is a positive feedback mechanism. Right? Had there been a decrease in the release of oxytocin, that would have become a negative feedback. Reversal of the initiating stimulus. Feed forward is anticipatory control. One more point, which are the positive feedback mechanisms? Remember the acronym CLAMP. Clotting, calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum during a muscle contraction. LH surge milk letdown reflex, action potential, depolarization phase, activation of inactive pancreatic enzymes to their active form, parturition, and if I add S here, shock, especially uncompensated or decompensated shock is an example of positive feedback. A healthy 22-year-old female medical student runs a 5K race, a 5-kilometer race, all except which of the following physiological changes are likely to occur in this woman's skeletal muscles during the race. Now, please remember, a local decrease in PO2. Whenever we exercise, the muscles are utilizing oxygen, there is going to be a fall, a local fall in PO2. This causes a vasodilation. It causes a relaxation of the precapillary sphincters. It causes a relaxation of the terminal arterioles and precapillary sphincters, and it increases the capillary blood flow. It causes a vasodilation everywhere except in the lungs where it produces a pulmonary vasoconstriction. So if there is a vasodilation, what will happen to the arterial diameter? It will increase. What will happen to the vascular conductance or blood flow? Increases. Remember, flow is directly proportional to the fourth power of radius. More the radius because of the dilation, more will be the flow. Decrease in vascular resistance, which is also true because resistance is inverse to the fourth power of radius. More the radius, less the resistance. Will there be a decrease in oxygen utilization? No. In fact, there is an increase in oxygen utilization. So this is an incorrect statement. Please remember the resting skeletal muscle blood flow is just 3 to 4 ml per minute per 100 gram of tissue. But during exercise, this increases to almost 70 to 80 ml per minute per 100 gram of tissue. There is a huge increase in skeletal muscle blood flow during exercise. And this increase in skeletal muscle blood flow is because of local metabolites. What are the local metabolites? A decrease in PO2, increase in PCO2. Increase in lactic acid, increase in H+, increase in adenosine, increase in temperature. All these factors combine together to increase the skeletal muscle blood flow. Of course, during exercise, there's also increase in heart rate, increase in force of contraction of the heart, increase in stroke volume, there is increase in cardiac output. But locally, at the level of the skeletal muscles, there is a vasodilation, which increases the skeletal muscle blood flow.